Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Dr. Mark Gomez, but you can call me Dr. G, and welcome to Health 360 with Dr. G. Today's topic, the human-pet bond, exploring the health benefits. The human-pet bond is truly a remarkable one. Do you ever notice how fulfilled you feel when you spend time with your pet? Pets soften our souls, brighten so many people's lives, create enduring friendships, and provide long-term emotional support. Interestingly, one can argue that many humans struggle to feel these effects from other humans. The human-pet bond is a mutually beneficial and dynamic relationship between people and animals that is essential to the health and well-being of both. Today on Health360 with Dr. G, we're exploring the health benefits of the human-pet bond. Again, my name is Dr. Mark Gomez, Dr. G, board certified internal medicine physician practicing at Edward Hospital in Naperville, Illinois. I'm also a member of the American College of Lifestyle and Medicine. Follow me across all the socials at Health360WDrG and check me out on my website at health360podcast.com. We have an amazing show for you today about the human pet bond. I have two excellent, amazing, passionate guests that are doing so many great things. Um, before you meet them, let me hit you with a quick disclaimer. The content of Health360 with Dr. G, a healthy German podcast, is for your information and entertainment purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. So let's get after it, y'all. I want to introduce my first guest today. We got a lot to cover. The mm -hmm. human pet bond. I want to introduce my first guest today. We are recent acquaintances. We met through a local networking group, and uh, she gave a presentation about the human pet bond. And after the presentation was over, I, I literally like ran up to her. And I was like, listen, we got to talk. Uh, I just love what you said. And it got this idea going. I was like, we got to talk. And let's talk about it on Health360 with Dr. G. So I'm going to introduce my guest today, um, Dr. Ginny Waltz, proud owner, veterinarian, and coach at the Welcome Wagon. Dr. Ginny, welcome to the show. Dr. G, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here today. Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited to have you on this show. You know, Dr. Ginny, every comic book hero has an origin story. Let's do it. Uh, tell us where you grew up, where you did your school, and you can say undergrad, uh, veterinarian school, why this topic is, and why this topic is so important to you each and every day. It gets you out of the bed. Yeah, well, I am from Northwest Indiana originally, and surprisingly enough, I always thought I wanted to be a human doctor. <laughs> Probably <laughs> due to my mom, when I was a little kid, I was able to stand up, stitches in the emergency room, and the, the fate was sealed. She told me I need to grow up to be a doctor. Um, she went back to school when I was in eighth grade as a nurse, uh, and I started getting really interested in the nursing field and like how diverse it was. So I actually uh, changed what I thought I wanted to do instead of going to IU for med school or pre-med. I ended up going to Purdue for nursing school. Um, around freshman orientation, I met my um, now husband and his dad was a vet. And so just being in Purdue, where it's one of the few vet schools in the country and having my now father-in-law be a veterinarian, I started seeing another side of what you could be like if you wanted to grow up and be a doctor. And so it was really the fate was sealed. Um, freshman year, the Purdue holds a uh, open house for their vet school. And when I walked into that vet school, I just knew what was meant to be. So kind of flash forward eight years later, graduated from Purdue in 2011. And so I've been practicing on and off uh, for 12 years. And um, what a lot of people don't know within the field is that a lot of veterinarians struggle with burnout and compassion fatigue. And so I practiced for a couple of years, uh, but did find myself struggling with burnout and compassion fatigue. And why um, the human animal bond is so important to me is because part of that burnout and compassion fatigue is has everything to do with the human animal bond. So I stopped practicing for a bit. I didn't think I was going to stay a clinician and I went into recruiting for a major corporation, which um, is pretty much a nationwide corporation. So I had 11 states, 80 hospitals. I traveled all over the place, went to vet schools, went to conferences, and I started to heal myself from um, you know this, those early years. And from that, I started falling in love with humans, because one of the things we're going to talk about is veterinarians. We don't take care of just 
animals. We take care of their, their human counterparts too. Mm -hmm. And so long story short, on April 1st, 2020, I ended up purchasing a mobile veterinary practice and really coming full circle with my just healing journey. Um, because now as I go into houses every day and I see pets where they are most comfortable, um, I see that human animal bond play out every day. I see cat toys everywhere, dog toys everywhere, kids toys everywhere. And it's integral how important and impactful that human animal bond is. Um, so that is our mission um, at my company here at the Welcome Wagon is to celebrate life and that human animal bond. Wonderful. What a journey. I really appreciate that. And I can't wait to get granular with you to talk about some of these awesome benefits that more and more people should know about. So thank you, Dr. Jenny. I want to introduce my next guest. She and I are relatively recent acquaintances as far as meeting face-to-face -face family, but we've worked indirectly for years for Edward Elmer's Health. And what she has done uh, with animal assisted therapy, her and her team have done amazing things. So if you've been hospitalized at Edward Hospital or Elmer's Hospital, or even Linden Oaks, or just anywhere throughout the Edward Elmer system, you may have been visited by a furry friend. So I want to introduce Cynthia Brooks. And Cynthia Brooks is the Program Administrator of Animal Assisted Therapy at Edward Hospital, Elmer's Hospital, and Linden Oaks Hospital. She's also the Supervisor of Volunteer Services at Edward Hospital and Linden Oaks Hospital locations. Cynthia, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dr. G. Um, I appreciate you asking me on here. I feel honored and I'm excited because <laughs> uh, it's a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. I know. Well, it's so awesome to have you on. Please tell us a little bit. You can tell us, you know, where you grew up and how did you kind of transition and get into this role and why it gets you going out of the bed every day with the human animal pet, the human pet bond? Well, um, my, my story is a little bit different how I got here. Um, I'm actually from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I was working up there and was transferred down to Chicago more years ago than I want to admit. <laughs> it's been a long time. Um, and worked in the private industry, worked in you know various management positions, um, buyers, uh, that type of thing. And while I was working at one of these places, I live in Naperville. I've been here for about 28 years. Um, I saw an ad in the paper for animal assisted therapy and I and I had the perfect dog for it. She was absolutely perfect. So Went and tried out, and sure enough, I got in the program. So for many years, uh, every other Thursday night, I would be at the hospital and uh, loving it, loving it. And it, it, I grew up with all kinds of animals. I grew up with dogs and cats and chickens and, and bunnies and ducks, you know, those little Easter presents that you get. And you keep them for a few months, and then they go live on a farm somewhere. <laughs> but um, always had animals around. Um so I kind of got more involved in like going to training with my dog and doing different things with my dog friends that I'd met at, at the hospital and um, had a job, a job change in 2008, like many people and got more involved with this and uh, worked with trainers, actually did some training with trainers and Eventually, I um, I was asked to come to the hospital and and uh, take over the program. So um, that's what I did, and loving every minute of it. I also um, I also test dogs for a, uh, a a nonprofit therapy organization because all of all of our dogs have to be certified and to have a membership. So I go to work every day loving it. Wonderful. Well, it's just awesome to have you on the show today. Uh, can't wait to get more granular. So there you have it, everybody. You met Dr. Jenny Waltz. You met Cynthia Brooks. Here's how the show works. I ask the questions. My awesome guests will give answers. I'll participate here and there where, where the answers are very easy and straightforward because uh, that's how I get down. But no, this show is for you. It's, gonna, it's such a fun topic. So when people come to the office, we call that the chief complaint. So the chief complaint, aka the question of the hour is this. What is the impact of the human pet bond? So first question goes to you, Dr. Jenny. Here it is. I like it. What is, let's give a little overview. What is, or what are the top reasons for pet ownership? Yeah, so I would probably say the number one reason for pet ownership is that companionship um, piece of it, um, especially as we came out of a pandemic. We saw so many people when they got trapped into their homes go out and get pets. Um, our pets give us purpose. Um, they help 
create just again a sense of where they want to live um, and what that well-being looks like for them. So I'd say a lot of um, people are going to look for that pet for companionship. Um, a lot of families are going to look for that pet because they want their kids to grow up with animals. And we'll talk about some of that benefits as it leads to children. Um, a lot of elderly people are going to look for pets to kind of help them stay younger and um, have their, their just their cognitive function work a little bit properly and um, have that laughter and that joy as part of their lives. Um, at the end of the day, our pets are very empathetic creatures and they take on so much of, a, of, of what we are kind of internalizing and um, they help take care of us. Wonderful. Here's this next question. I like this one. Uh, this is for you, Cynthia. True or false? The human pet bond is a mutually beneficial and dynamic relationship between people and animals that is essential to the health and well-being of both. What's your take? I say true. Um, Please explain. I, well, the the bond that that you form with an animal and that you can see somebody else forming with an animal is is very intimate in a lot of ways. Um, you have when you are the handler or the owner of the dog, you've got somebody you have to take care of, somebody you have to care for, um, somebody that means something so much to you. Um, that's that's the way it has been in my life and, and by the people I've seen around. Um, and the dog, you can see it in the dog too. When you come home from work, they're so excited to see you. Um, they come up to you, they, they're wagging all over the place and they're kissing you and you can just feel the mutual love and admiration and everybody seems to be happy. <laughs> I'm happy. She's happy. Um, it's just, it's kind of a, it's a, a nice, it's a nice warm feeling. Um, and, um, uh, something that I hope more people will after this, um, maybe try out and it's just, uh, it's, it's a good thing. You know, I think about when you start talking about that feeling of love and and being and your pet being um, uh, non judgmental. You know, we scientifically or biochemically we release a hormone called oxytocin, and we call that kind of the love or the bonding hormone. And it's so powerful to just for your boosting your mood and work with other neurotransmitters in the brain to help out with your overall overall feeling of well being. And the same thing happens with pet owners is they get this oxytocin boosts this powerful bond. It builds trust. It builds more bond. It builds altruism. It is so powerful. And that's what you get that connection. And that is why uh, pet owners tend to live longer than non-pet owners when it comes to those kind of fashions. Just fascinating kind of thing. Dr. Mm -hmm. Jenny, what's your take on, on, on just really, um, you know, not only just this human pet bond, um, but also your role. Why don't we, why, maybe we'll start there backwards. Let's start with what's the role of the vet, veterinarian when it comes to the human pet bond and how do we continue to, to um, help health in a more dynamic way? With the veterinarian role, it's almost like twofold. So I'm a small animal veterinarian and I work with companion animals, dogs and cats, but I'll back up just for a second and talk Oops. about the global piece of a veterinarian's role within the human animal bond. A um, lot of people don't know how important the veterinarian role is to our biosecure, biosecurity and our food security within the, the world. Um, and without that piece to it, um, there's many diseases that would not be treated or um, even prevented without that role. So there's a whole One Health initiative with veterinarians, and there's so many even within the veterinary field, so many different aspects a veterinarian can take. Um, I uh, was more drawn to that companion animal piece. So um, for me, it's the dogs and cats in that role. And so as a small animal veterinarian, I'm a general practitioner. I love multiple diseases and couldn't decide which one I wanted to focus on. And so I really... Um, think my role as that veterinarian is to one, act as an advocate for that pet pair, that pet patient. They can't speak and they can't um, verbalize all the things that they're feeling. And so I do a lot of educating pet parents just about how to keep their pet living healthy, long lives. Um, and I help educate them and advocate them throughout the whole life stages from when they're puppies and kids to when there's adults. And especially in where my heart lies and my passion is, is when they're seniors and geriatrics. Um, and I help that aging process go as smoothly as possible. So they really can um, be with their pet for as long as possible. And then even when it comes time to saying goodbye. 
You know, I appreciate you. And even when you were saying in the beginning that that you're not only working with amazing animals, but you work with amazing people. Yeah. Um, and that is certainly rewarding uh, in, in and of itself as well. So what I want to do now is I want to get into some more of the specifics of the human pet bond and the health benefits that we'll see. So I kind of broke this down into a couple of different categories, mental health, uh, healthy aging, um, you know, life development, uh, and even talking about like isolation and loneliness. So let's start with like a little bit of mental health. So mental health uh, for everybody that's listening, just refers to our cognitive, behavioral, and emotional well-being and mental health and well-being are important at every stage of life from childhood and adolescence through adulthood. So I'll come back at you, um, uh, Dr. Dr. Waltz. Uh, here's the first question here. How does owning a pet affect mental health? So overall, mental health is going to be improved when you own a pet. Again, we talked a little bit about that love piece of it. I really truly think if you want to experience unconditional love, get a pet because they are going to be the ones that um, provide that mental health or that unconditional love. And it's all it's going to trick down into your mental health. And so um, there are a lot of stories I hear about those who were really struggling with their mental health, struggling to the point where they were almost suicidal. And so many times they never really completed that final act because they didn't know how to leave their pet behind. So I think that there are millions of pet out there, pets out there who've saved their owners from those deep, dark days that were upon them. So it could be as, um, as um, deep as a conversation as that, but it could also be as simple as a conversation of, um, I once had a roommate who went through a really tough breakup and I swear my cat, my cat did not see me that whole year. My cat took care of her during that hard breakup. And so we talk about mental health from um, just human life stages from when kids are little and they may have been have anxiety or needing to gain confidence in school, or maybe they got picked on and bullied and they come home and they have that animal who's gonna give them that unconditional love all the way up to um, adults and elderly. And there's just so many ways that that pet is gonna be there for a human. Well, you know, you hit the head on the nail where they just they did just the multitude of effects that can happen with mental health. You know, we talk about lowering your cortisol levels or stress hormone as well to lowering blood pressure, um, you know, and just reducing those sensations of loneliness as well, too. So um, thank you. You know, Cynthia, let me ask you this question. Uh, are pet owners less stressed than non-pet owners? And uh, let me ask you this. And are they happier? than non-pet owners. Less stress, more stress, happier, or not as happy as non-pet owners? What's your take? I would say um, everyday living, less stress altogether. Um, I would say that if there's something that's not right with my dog, if she's not feeling well, more stress because they can't speak to you. They can't tell you what the problem is. Um, I've had a couple of dogs that have gone through some some awful diseases. And it's, it's heartbreaking and stressful to watch that because they can't tell you what the problem is. And you are taking them all, you know, to specialists and everything. And um, that part is more stressful as, um, but on a day to day, you know, the stress, the stress relieves for me when I come in the door and, and see her, uh, you know, can't wait to see me. Can't wait to get fed. Of course, <laughs> that's your favorite thing. Um, but as far as um, a happy, so I I checked out the facts on that, and they say that um, in in various studies that I that I looked online that pet owners are no happier than non pet owners, and um, you know these are professionals that did these these surveys, but. I don't know. I'm happy. I'm happy with my dog. I'm I'm happy when I see other people's dogs. They just make me smile. They're kind of like a baby laughing. You know, you just you, you have to smile when you see an, another dog or a cat or or whatever you like, a gerbil, a bunny or whatever. Um, for me personally, yes, I'm happier. And yes, I am less stressed. Um, and yeah. I think that's, pets, pets that's allow. Yeah, go right ahead. Go yeah, ahead. I think pets allow a good ability to practice mindfulness because we're all on our phones all day long and we come in through that door and um, we need to play with that pet and we need to exercise that pet. 
um, it gives us a time to be fully present in the moment. And so I think those who can practice that mindfulness and utilize their pets for what they're providing for us can then be less stressful and happier in the long run. <laughs> Absolutely. And Dr. Jenny, let me ask you this question. If say somebody's come, you know, you're, you're visiting, uh, you're, you're seeing, you know, a pet, uh, you're seeing their, their family members, but say they are stressed because maybe you are concerned about something that's going on with the pet as you're doing your diagnostics. How do you comfort the family in that moment that obviously are very attached uh, emotionally uh, to their to their pet? How do you how do you just talk to people? That's one of the things where, you know, I'll be honest, a lot of the young, like the old generation of training, we, we weren't really trained on all that client communication. I know now in schools, they really are, but there is so much part of our job that is advocacy and social work and veterinary social work is a study that's getting even more popular. But, you know, Cynthia, you're right. When you're worried about your pet, they are just like your kids where you're worried about it. And um, there is, you know, there's, diagnostics that need to be done. And not everybody is going to go down that route to find out exactly what is going on. Some people need the peace of mind. Some people don't need the peace of mind, but that worry nonetheless is still there. And so my role and my team's role is to really be there to answer questions, to be as transparent as possible. In veterinary medicine, we do have to worry about costs. We have insurance, but it's not the same as human um, medical insurance. And so we have to have those financial conversations. Um, and, and that le leads to another stress upon, upon mm -hmm. themselves. And so it's all through um, us to me is transparency, education and support uh, is where when you find that relationship with your vet team, you're going to get through those anxiety situations as best as possible. There have been times when I've certainly treated patients in my practice that have had, um, uh, you know, the, the downstream effect of having um, health challenges of with their pet, um, whether it's their pet that has been become ill or their pet that is, has certainly passed away. And, um, and uh, so for me to, to see the people that I take care of, it's, it's how I would support them. You know, you just, just non-judgment, you, you're, you're have show empathy and you just tell them that this is a safe space. Um, sometimes in with people, we have to uh, start therapy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we have to be, we have to be okay with talking about that. And we're, we're humans. We're not robots. Well, we're emotional people. Um, and, and we have to be able to comfortable talking about that. Uh, it's no different and and so different than if we lose a loved one that's a human. Um, uh, the the attachment's so strong. I think I think I remember uh, Dr. Ginny, uh, you've talked about that um, before. It's like a was there a term for that? Like when you lose your um, your first pet? Oh, so that's your heart or, pet. So okay, in, right. in your lifetime, you may have one or more heart pets. And that's that pet that you've bonded so well to that almost maybe no other pet will compare to it. But it's like that one pet that just it stole, they stole your heart. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I everyone almost ever, always has one. <laughs> if you're lucky, mm -hmm. you have more than one. Let's let's talk about a little bit of healthy aging and how the human pet bond affects aging. And I'll the first question for you, Cynthia, but here's the, the, the kind of leeway. Uh, healthy aging is a lifelong process of making healthy decisions and lifestyle choices. So ensuring physical health at every stage of life helps us live longer and reduces the risk of illness, disability, and death. So, so Cynthia, let's start with you. Um, how does owning a pet affect physical health? Well, if you're... Um... If you're giving back to your pet what they're giving to you, you're you're taking them out for exercise, yeah. you're playing with them, you're being active with them. Um, and that's good for our for our heart, for our soul. Um, and it just uh, being really active and they make you active. They say mm -hmm. if um, if you're what do they say if your dog's fat, you're not getting enough exercise? Or if you're fat, your dog's not getting enough exercise either or. So um, it's very important to not only to exercise them, but to, to play with them, to, to do what they like to do. Um, there's studies, of course, on, on um, the effects of having pets with, um, with people with heart disease. They found that, that their, their, um, their cholesterol was lower, their blood sugar was lower, um, and their, their, their cardiac fitness was better. Um, there's plenty of studies on that, on, um, 
uh, on that uh, with dogs and pets. Um, and I, I am being happier, you know, mm -hmm. the, the whole depression thing, the whole uh, dopamine and serotonin, you, you know, they, they bring that out in you to make you happier. Yeah. I will say that the American, it's true that, that there's plenty of studies out there from cardiovascular health, American Health, American Heart Association, actually their scientific statement um, does connect pet ownership to the prevention of cardiovascular disease. And so we've seen like, uh, it's actually interesting in their studies that of all pets, dogs appear most likely to have the positive influence on physical activity. So sorry, uh, snake owners out there um, or bird or bird, or bird owners. Uh, I was just trying to be funny, but I guess mm -hmm. it's not really that funny, but that's all right. Uh, it's like, Row! and cat owners, yes, you can do stuff uh, as well too, but dogs tend to be the best. And then we know that dog owners typically engage in more physical activity uh, than per week than do non-dog uh, owners. So there's no doubt about that one. Uh, Dr. Dr. Waltz, let me ask you this question. So uh, actually one, one other here on, um, on, um, on the physical health. When you're seeing, you know, your clients in the office, when you're going to your clients and you see them, I mean, can you see as as your as the as the dog gets healthier or as the as their pet gets healthier, do you see some of the physical changes in the in their owners as well too in people? Oh yeah, I mean, anecdotally, I would say so many pets mimic their owners, um, and in our pet population, our, um, our dogs and cats are obese and overweight. And so when we work and like put them on calorie counting plans, oftentimes they'll come in and be like, look, you know, my dog lost weight, but I lost weight too. And, you know, they kind of could they do it together. And my professor always told a story of, um, when he was a fourth year in vet student, his cat started urinating outside the box and he tried all these things and, um, you know, it wasn't really working just yet. And then when he graduated and he moved away and his, his pet was fine, his cat stopped doing it. And it was like his, she was picking up on his stress. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times when I do think when our pets are not as healthy, it is a conversation of what's going on in the home too, because a lot of times if a human's not healthy, these animals are taking on some of that, that part, and it's playing out in different roles as well, um, which is awesome when I'm doing house calls and I can have those one-on-one -on -one conversations. Wonderful. Let's change up here. Let's do a couple more of these. Let's talk about the human pet bond as it relates to um, uh, development, lifestyle development, child development, and through life. So the human pet bond provides benefits to health at every stage of life. And research demonstrates a positive influence on such a bond on a child's physical, social, emotional, cognitive development. So here's the first question for you, Dr. Dr. Uh, Waltz. How can pets promote healthy social development, social competence, and self-esteem in children. So I think one of the biggest things that um, happens when kids are around pets is they learn self-esteem and self-confidence. Um, they learn a development of trust. Again, that unconditional love, that, that best friend that they have that they could go talk to at any point in time. Um, and then it also helps them with the nonverbal communication, compassion, empathy, all of those different things that they get to learn from their pet. And then I think one of the biggest things that if pet or if parents are willing to talk to their children is pets do teach us the circle of life. Um, I think that is one of the most difficult things any parent, even when they have college kids deals with is how do I include or tell my, my child that their pet is then coming to the end of the life and we need to make that decision. And so they are one of the first um, times they're going to learn about grief and loss and everything like that. You know, back in the day when we were in school, we had a, uh, this is back in the eighties for me, but, but we had the pet uh, uh, hamster. So I have a question for you, Cynthia. So uh, are there social, behavioral, and academic effects of having pets in the classroom? What's your take on that? Well, um, it's kind of interesting <laughs> because uh, talking about the the dogs um, or, or uh, how children deal with pets and animals, being able to speak to them, being able to share with them, um, they uh, what I found was they find that um, pets in the classroom may increase their social skills um, they, and competence. And um, I've seen it firsthand when I've taken my dog to a, a school with, uh, with children that may have reading problems. 
they may stutter, they may whatever. And they sit next to my dog and, and read a book to my dog. Like there's, there's nothing wrong. They, they feel, I think, safe talking to a dog where they may not feel safe talking to a person, a dog or a cat or whatever is in the classroom. Um, and I think that they have, they found that it, it has decreased their, uh, their social, poor social behaviors and, and increased better social behaviors with pets in the classroom. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of magical to watch when you see kids with dogs there, or I suppose with, with gerbils or hamsters or whatever, there's a sense of caring for them because they have to, they have to take care of them. Um, these smaller animals, I, I remember when I was in school too, you know, this one, this one has to feed it this day. And then somebody got yeah. to take home over the weekend. Yeah. So it's a sense of responsibility and, and learning how to take care of, of, someone other than yourself taking care let's of talk, let's talk one more one more broad topic here and then we're gonna get into some faqs and then some mysteries and facts but let's talk about we got to talk about depression we got to talk about loneliness as well too so i'll set it up so social isolation and loneliness are growing public health epidemics and uh flashback to check out my episode number three of health 360 with dr g when i discuss the topics of social isolation and loneliness in adults more than one third of Americans older than age 65 and about half of those older than age 85 live alone. And research shows that social relationships, both quantity and quality, profoundly affect mental and physical health. So Dr. Waltz, here's the question. Can the human pet bond decrease loneliness and depression? I definitely think so. I definitely think it can. And again, that is that goes back to that companionship. It goes back to um really the sense of purpose. So, you know, when someone is struggling with depression, when they are struggling with loneliness and they're even just having difficulty getting out of the bed every day because they have to take care of that pet, it almost is like that driver for that purpose. Um, and it's one of those things where, um, and I'm sure in your po in that podcast episode, you talked about, you know, the percentage of people who live alone um, and how preva prevalent loneliness is, especially in, in our elderly community and having someone, you know, it's funny how you catch yourself talking to yourself and it's just talking to your pet. And it's just those little things like that, that just help um, take the everyday and give it purpose. And then Cynthia, let me ask you this question. Should more doctor's offices Healthcare facilities incorporate pets into their treatment plans. What's your take on that? Well, from what I've seen in the in the healthcare setting, um, we see many people coming in, and not just patients, but visitors, relatives that are highly stressed because they don't know what's wrong with them, or they're worried about what the prognosis or diagnosis may be. And bringing a, bringing a pet into that atmosphere, um, even, even people waiting for their loved ones in, in surgical waiting, they're, they're all, all tensed up. I've been there before in surgical waiting and I've been all tensed up. You bring, you bring a dog in there, um, they just kind of melt a little bit. They forget about what they're worried about. Um, they're just, it, it, it makes them relax. It makes them um, not so, so wound up and probably will listen better because they're more relaxed and not, not thinking about the things that are running through their head. I think it's great in, in the offices and the staff love them too. Well, wonderful. Well, let's do something here called uh, Frequently Asked Questions. And when you join us here on Health 360 with Dr. G, um, sitting down, talk with Dr. Dr. Ginny Waltz, uh, veterinarian, uh, and Cynthia Brooks, uh, program administrator for animal assisted therapy with Edward Elmer's Health. And uh, just an awesome talk about the, the human pet bond. Well, let's get some FAQs in there like we always do. Here it is. First one, this goes to you, Dr. Waltz. I like this one. Can owning a pet slow mental decline? I would say, yes, it can. Um, again, because you are going to be having to take care and you're going to have that responsibility of that pet. And a lot of times, um, again, like the loneliness piece, if the socialization helps with that mental decline. So if you are out walking your dog, ch chatting with your neighbors, whatever it may be, it's that just that daily practice of your cognitive function that's going to help. Well, I, and I always say what is good for your 
heart is good for your brain. And so that activity, of course, is certainly beneficial. Actually, uh, you mentioned that you, you went to Purdue. Uh, one of the Big Ten rivals, University of Michigan, uh, put out some interesting data about uh, cognitive decline, uh, showing less cognitive decline in um, in uh, older adults with that were pet owners versus uh, non of pet owners. Here's the next question. I like this one. This is for you, Cynthia. I like this. <clears throat> um, we'll explain this one. What's the difference between emotional support dogs or some emotional support animals, service animals, and therapy animals? Well, there's there's quite a difference in all of them. And I'm going to add one in there. Um, Please. Which is the um, the working, the working class dogs. Um, the emotional support dogs are for people who are maybe depressed, maybe have anxiety, um, maybe have uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and having that companion animal with them helps them uh, through their day. Uh, the, these animals are not service animals, if you will. Um, so they, they don't have as many, um, they aren't welcome. I don't want to say they're not welcome. They're not allowed in many places that that um, service animals are, and I'll get to those in a minute. Um, but they're trying to make a, some inroads for people, like with their apartments or their houses, allowing those dogs in, or do dogs or cats, or or whatever the animal may be, in with them. Um, service animals perform a specific duty, which is if it's for somebody who um, is blind. They help them maneuver their way through life. Hearing, um, there's also people. There's also dogs that are, um, and probably other animals. I'm just aware of dogs that are sensitive to things like a, a diabetic. Their levels, their insulin levels dropping. Um, there are. Um, there was one more. I'm sorry. Um, they. They also um, have a defined purpose. Some that's people that were in. They're, they're physically handicapped somehow. And they, um, they may need help opening doors, picking things up. Um, and those, those animals are allowed in restaurants. They're allowed pretty much everywhere. They're not charged to go in airplanes um, like, a, like a, a family dog would be. They, they do, they go, they ride free. Um, and then you have the working dogs who are bomb sniffers. They are cadaver dogs. They they go to places like the World Trade Center and and find um, human remains. Um, there are dogs that also, and I just learned this. There are allergy dogs that will go as, go out and see if there's an allergen, like a peanut allergen, in an area, um, which I think is pretty cool too. And then you've got therapy dogs and therapy dogs. Um, there's animal assisted therapy dogs who actually help with some issues medically or psychologically. Um, they are used as uh, used in a group setting in a mental health facility. I've been I've been involved with that. Um, and they we've also had dogs that go for maybe very sensitive uh physical examinations of children where we need a distraction for them. Um, and then there's the animal assisted therapy dogs that, that we also have in our group that just go to make people happy. Yeah. They, they come to brighten their day. Yeah. They, they might be feeling really bad because of it, it could be a staff member and it could be a patient and they're just there to make people happy. Awesome. All right, here we go. Dr. Dr. Waltz, I like this one. Here's a question for you. Uh, <clears throat> what should I do if my pet and family member, can't say it, let me say it again. What should I do if my pet and family members are not developing a bond, um, aka like a birth of a new baby, a uh, new blended family, et cetera, with their pet? So number one, you need to consult with your vet about this situation. Do not go through that process alone because there's going to be many times, whether there's the birth of the new baby, whether it is blended family members, maybe your pets are moving in with their pets. There's a lot of different ways that we could talk about that. Um, and then a lot of it does come down to trying to anticipate this as much as possible so that you could be ready for that part. Um, and so it, there's a lot of training that needs to be involved um, if it's needed. So again, 
knowing like areas where you can get dog training, but dogs also dogs or cats, they need a safe space. So they need a place in their home too. Like it's not just your home. You've invited them into your home. Cats, um, just a general rule of thumb, they need a thousand square feet per um, cat. Um, and so like you could have areas where it's like you have cat trees, cat things higher up that adds more square scale space to the footage. So cat, they're going to want to jump in their crib. I've got pictures of my cats <laughs> jumping in the crib and if that may make you nervous and then there's all live tails, things like that. But um, they're just going to be curious. Dogs, um, they usually, they are cave animals. So they will need like their little safe spot. So part of it is um, allowing them and understanding animal behavior first, um, asking us trainers questions, vets questions, things like that, and then taking it slow. And then knowing that there could be friction and bumps along the way, but most cases they're going to work themselves out. And so patience is also a big thing too. All right. Cynthia, let me ask you this question. What do you do? Maybe a, a flip, kind of flip side of thing. What if somebody hasn't had uh, a lot of experience with an animal? They're not well versed in, in being around pets. How do you ease them into that human pet bond? Well, when we are visiting people, um, many times their children will sign them up for a pet visit and they didn't want it. <laughs> so <laughs> we try to we try to go in as graciously. If they don't want to see us, that's fine. Um, we tend to keep the dog away from them, um, just kind of talking slowly. We, we, we talk to them about their day or, or their life, or if they've ever had any dogs or cats or whatever. And it's kind of a slow thing. And you have to, you have to pick up on what, what their vibes are, uh, what the people's vibes are. Um, and, and it also works the other way around as well with, with dogs. Sometimes there just isn't, isn't that connection there. So you don't, you just, you, you talk to the people, you, you make conversation with them and um, hopefully nobody's feelings get hurt, but sometimes that's, that's just, that just happens sometimes. We're going to see two more of these FAQs. I like this one. This is for you, Dr. Waltz. Uh, if someone does not feel ready for pet ownership, but they want to um, learn more about pet ownership, are there other ways that they can warm up to the process before they become pet owners? Yeah. So I think, you know, doing research is really important, especially when it comes to dogs and the various dog breeds that are out there. So that is, you know, pet relinquishment is a big problem um, in the United States. And so doing that homework really will help to stop that or prevent that from occurring even more. So there's different ways of like getting involved in like the community involvements that have dog areas where you can go spend time with dogs, working with fosters and shelters where you can do meet and greets. I know so many people foster first and they're like, I'm a foster fail. That's a great way <laughs> to start getting involved because it gives you that peace of mind that I'm not going to relinquish this pet if it doesn't work out. Um, and you do that, could do that. Um, with cats, oh gosh, I was just in Charleston, South Carolina, and they had a little cat cafe. And I know there's one in the Chicago cat too. Cafe. It's a big cat cafe. It's a big um, thing in Japan is cat cafes where there are literally cats that are up for adoptions and you could do your, it's almost like a working area where you could go hang out, read a book, <laughs> work on some, drink some coffee and like, spend some time with cats. So if you live in an area that can't have animals, there are still ways to spend time with them. Wonderful. I'm thinking, by the way, as you said, like in the home, the cat, a cat needs a thousand, a thousand square feet. I'm thinking about these uh, cafes where it's like cats are like all over the place. You're trying to drink a latte. Uh, that sounds awesome, though. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let's do one more FAQ. Then we'll get to some myth versus facts. This is for you, Cynthia. Do we know the answer? Here's a question. Which animal has the strongest bond with humans? Do we know the answer to that? Or uh, Cynthia? I, I think that's a very personal, mm -hmm. uh, a personal choice. There, there are lists, dogs top the list, I think, because they're the most popular and then comes cats um, and then fish, I think are in there and bunnies and gerbils and even chickens, mm -hmm. which, you know, the chickens are very intelligent. Uh, there, there was a list with snakes that not my thing, but many people may may like them. I think it's just what your own personal preference is. What do you think, Dr. Waltz? You think so too? Personal preference? Oh yeah. I'd say it's no just doubt. so surprising mm -hmm. the amount of like various species out there that even dolphins like bond with 
with um, people um, and elephants, horses, things like that. So it is definitely, you know, here in the U.S. what we're used to. But um, you'd be surprised at those relationships among even the crazier species. There we go. It is what it is. You got to do it. Let's do this here. Let's do Speaking of doing things, myths versus facts. We do this on each episode of Health 360 with Dr. G. I'll say a statement. My awesome guest will say uh, the whether it's a myth or a fact. We're going to go through this like, like boom, 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 boom. We'll keep this thing moving. This is awesome. Here we go. This is for you, Dr. Walt. Start with you. Myth or fact, please explain. Owning a pet has mental and physical benefits. Myth or fact, please explain. Uh, definitely um, a fact. Those a lot we alluded to. It lowers blood pressure. It helps you stay in shape. It helps your cognitive function and ability. Um, and then it overall affects your mental health. All right, here we go. This one's for Dr. G. I'll actually participate in one of these things for, for the first time in this episode. I just joke. <laughs> but here we go. Like so, this is for Dr. G. Pet ownership reduces U.S. health care costs. And the answer is fact. Uh, about 85 million U.S. households have pets. Um, uh, according to the Happy Foundation, and actually pet ownership has saved the U.S. healthcare system an estimated $11.7 billion. And that was determined based on lower incidence of physician office visits by pet owners as compared to non-pet owners. And additional savings were actually calculated for increased physical activity for pet owners, such as dog owners who walk their dog five times or more per week. All right, Cynthia, I like this one. Here it is. Myth of fact, please explain. Pets provide security during times of stress. Oh, I think absolutely that's true. Um, your your pet is is a non judgmental, unconditional, loving animal, and and having that type of a relationship brings brings my stress level down. I'll tell you that much, um, and I think it it does that for the general public as well from studies that I've seen. Excellent. This next one's for you, Dr. Waltz. I like this one. Uh, organizations are stepping up to support pet ownership. Myth or fact? Oh, I would say true. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about the foster first for, and that's one example, but so many um, companies that are now allowing you to bring your pet to work. Um, and as we come out of that post COVID era is like, people don't want to leave their pet. So companies are letting you bring their pet to work. Um, and then, um, um, just pet insurance, more companies are offering that as an ancillary benefit to their employees to be able to have pet insurance for pets. So I would say definitely fact. That's All awesome. Right. Mm-hmm. That is awesome. Well, that is I'll awesome. tell you what, I tell you what, that is awesome. Uh, we're going to do this because the last two myths versus facts I've written down, we've actually already answered them. So we're going to do this. We got about five minutes left. In the beginning, we call it the chief complaint. In the end, we call it the assessment and plan. And so, which means when we give somebody a diagnosis, a treatment plan, and of course, we schedule a follow-up. So I'll start with you, Cynthia. Give us a few take-home points of people that have been listening to this podcast, um, people that are interested in nurturing the human pet bond. Maybe they're already doing it now. Maybe they want to start doing the human pet bond. But give us a take-home point for people that have listened. What's the next steps if they want to take the human pet bond further in their lives? Well, if the, for the people that don't have a pet, I would say do your research, figure out what pet matches your lifestyle, um, your financial situation as well, because they pets do cost money yearly. You have to take care of them just like you take care of yourself. Um, yeah, find, find a dog that, that, that you really think will fit in. If you don't know, a, a dog show is a great place to go to talk to, to some of the people that are showing their dogs and what some of the, the, the pluses and the minuses of a particular breed are. Um, and, and I think what's really most important is do something with your pet. Don't just let them lay around and don't let you lay around. Interact with them, have fun with them, go out and train with them or run with them. Um, and you'll see a lot of benefits in your life. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Cynthia. Dr. Waltz, give us a few take home points from your end. People that have been listening to this podcast, um, hopefully just super excited about pets. Um, and how do we take this next, how do we continue to nurture and, and just, just embrace the human pet bond? 
So I always say, what better way to experience life than to experience life with your pet? And so I think that if um, you're thinking about having a pet, you already have a pet is just like take a moment and think about how amazing that opportunity is, is to be able to experience that life with the pet. I think as we take better care of ourselves and we raise our own consciousness, we're going to take better care of our pets. Um, So I think that's also super important. And then I think that there are millions of ways to enhance that bond um, with, with your pet and really truly have that best friend that we also want and desire. And then of course, as the vet, I think it's important to have routine vet care and keep (laughs) up with those annual physical exams and prevention really truly is the best medicine. And by having a great relationship with your, your veterinarian, you are going to be able to slow disease processes down, detect disease processes faster. um, So your pets can live longer, healthier lives. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Dr. Waltz. And before we get to my final thoughts, we do a section here on Health360 with Dr. G called the Listener Healthy Oh Yeah Content. And uh, this was, I'm going to frame for you, this was a response to something I put on the socials about what kinds of activities do you do to restore yourself physically and mentally? So here's a quote from loyal listener, JG. I love road trips, flying, and getting away for a few days. Uh, Well, thank you, JG. I always enjoy hearing about your journey and with your permission, I'll read it on the show. Simply message me across all the socials at Health360WDrG and who knows, your story may be a catalyst for someone else who needs to hear it. And my final thoughts are this. The human pet bond is absolutely a mutually beneficial and dynamic relationship between people and animals that is essential to the health and well-being of both. Science supports that the pet effect is real for people of all ages and pet ownership has many health benefits. However, you don't need research to see for yourself that life-changing experiences happen when pets are in your life. Just ask any of the 85 million households in the United States that have been enjoying the health benefits of the human pet bond each and every day. So I wanna thank my guest today, Dr. Jenny Waltz, proud owner, veterinarian, and coach at the Welcome Wagon, and Cynthia Brooks, Program Administrator of Animal Assisted Therapy at Edward Hospital, Elmer's Hospital, and Linden Oaks Hospital, also the Supervisor of Volunteer Services at Edward Hospital and Linden Oaks Hospital locations. Thank you both for coming on the show. Thanks, Dr. Thank G. So I enjoyed this. Yes, I oh, did my too. pleasure. And I can't wait to catch up with you both soon. Hey, everybody, you've been listening to and watching Health 360 with Dr. G, a healthy driven podcast. This episode is written by Mark D. Gomez, MD, and Tiffany E.R. Gomez. The producers are Tiffany E.R. Gomez and Sarah Zwack. Audio and video production specialist is Mike Paskey. Copyright 2023, Edward Elmer's Health, all rights reserved. For more awesome health information, visit me at health360podcast.com and follow me across all the socials at health 360 G. This is Dr. G signing off. And until next time, peace. Out.